Welcome, everyone. My name is Erica George. I'm the Samuel D. Thurman Professor of Law, and I have the honor of directing the Tanner Humanities Center. One of the most fulfilling parts of that role is getting to work with people like Sean Collins, our speaker for today, who it's my pleasure to introduce to you. Um, he's given me a quick biography. I guess he just wants to get right to the substance of what is an extraordinary paper and a wonderful work in progress. Sean is a PhD candidate here with us in literal in, candidate in literary and cultural studies. I know he also works closely with our colleague Jeff uh, McCarthy in environmental humanities who I see on the call. Um, he's a member of our English department at the University of Utah. Sean's research interests include modernist studies, eco-criticism, new materialism, and post-colonial theory. His work has already appeared in the Nautilus, a maritime journal of literature, history, and culture, and in the Journal of Comparative Literature and Aesthetics. I enjoyed um, having the opportunity to read Sean's work last week. It introduced me to new texts and writers writing in fields I wasn't aware that they touched, that I was familiar with in other contexts. So it was quite illuminating um, and very interesting. And please join me in welcoming Sean to deliver his paper, which I have here, Nature and the Nation, Preservation and the Politics of the Modernist Environmental Imagination. Welcome, Sean. Is there a way, do I just share my screen for my slides here? Is that correct? Oh, um, yes, Katie. Oh, we've uh, got it. Okay, thank you. And then we are inviting you to have your camera and um, sound off during the presentation. Thank you. Just to clarify, am I, are you looking at my pres presenter view or at just the slides? I wanna make sure before we get going. We have just your slides. Awesome, okay. Uh, thank you, Erica. Um, I want to firstly thank the, the Tanner Humanity Center for graciously hosting me this year. Uh, it's been such a wonderful experience, and uh, my work has really greatly uh, benefited from the feedback I've received um, from conversations in the hallway, from the workshops, uh, from attending all of the wonderful seminars, uh, authors meet, author meet readers series, all of these wonderful things that we do, um, and I'm just very grateful to be here. Um, I also want to thank my dissertation writing group, um, particularly uh, Bobby Kennedy, who I believe is here, uh, Yvette Milette, and Kelly Craig. Um, I really want to thank you for helping me develop this project as it was beginning. Um, I, I really greatly uh, appreciate it. I'll hide this here so we can see the slides. Um, and I also want to thank my dissertation committee members, my chair, uh, Vince Chang, um, Jeff McCarthy, Lisa Swanstrom, um, and all the others. I really want to thank you for um, everything um, that you've given to my project. I, I truly appreciate it. So um, the working title for this project has shifted a little bit. I'm going to go with the one that was presented on the, um, the poster itself. Um, let's see. Is there a... Oh, great. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, so the life of significant soil preservation and the politics of the modernist environmental um, imagination. Um, and I want to preface this, this talk by saying that um, I'm really in the early drafting stages of this chapter. Um, it still feels kind of loose. And so I really um, welcome questions, comments, texts, suggestions that you might have to help improve um, this this, this chapter that I'm working toward. Um, and before I hop into um, the, the chapter itself, I thought it might be useful to situate my dissertation very briefly to give you a sense of the, the larger scope um, of the project itself. So when we take a hike in the mountains, we go explore the wilderness, or when we visit a national park, what sorts of ideological baggage might we uh, be unknowingly carrying with us even as we are out enjoying nature? The U.S. national parks encourage us to experience America while preserving America's past. Similarly, the British National Trust strives to offer a connection with nature while protecting the, nature's, uh, the nation's heritage. If nature contains national heritage, what politics are entangled in preservation narratives? At the turn of the 20th century, environmental organizations, including the newly formed U.S. national park system and the British National Trust, sought to preserve nature within a rapidly modernizing world a world that witnessed not only the development of ecological science, but also the rise of far-right nationalism. My dissertation focuses on the politically fraught archive of literary modernism in order to explore the connection between the protection of nature and the preservation of national and racial culture during the formative years of the modern environmental movement. 
this project is interdisciplinary, which is reflected in the way that I've um, kind of put together my archive. To carry out this project, I draw on a, a diverse collection of eco-critical theory, environmental history, modernist literature, uh, post and post-colonial studies pertaining to issues such as ecological science, uh, environmental aesthetics, nationalism, and preservation organizations. One of the central aims of this dissertation project more broadly is to not only uncover a rich and underexamined archive for environmental scholarship, um, namely literary modernism, but also to reveal the political implications of modernist ecological aesthetics and the extent of their impact for contemporary environmental discourse, particularly eco-criticism and the new materialisms. More broadly, the interdisciplinary nature of this project, I hope, will contribute to a range of uh, interdisciplinary fields that organize under the banner of the environmental humanities. Um, and as I see it, and I know Jeff is doing a lot of work in this field, uh, while environmental humanities scholars have largely overlooked modernism as a viable archive for examining uh, environmental issues, um, my, my dissertation project um, demonstrates that modernists engage with preservationist discourse across multiple genres, including novels, poetry, drama, and nonfiction. Um, and I, one of the arguments that I make uh, more broadly throughout this dissertation is that the, uh, excuse me, modernist uh, formal and exper uh, innovation was uh, also informed by newly emergent concepts uh, from environmental science, such as the idea of vitalism from the pioneering work of the ecologist Arthur Tansley um, in, in 1913. Okay, so that is kind of a, an, an overview of, of where the, the project is kind of headed. And I'd like to also just situate you very briefly in the work that I've done thus far. And I'm happy to take some questions about the dissertation more broadly if there are things um, that come to mind. Um, so the, the chapter that I'm presenting today, I'm tentatively calling Enchanted, Enchained, National Parks, Environmental Regeneration and Literary Modernism. Uh, this is the third chapter that I've drafted of the dissertation thus far. Uh, my first chapter is focused on Marianne Moore's An Octopus. Um, if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to do so. It's a really wonderful modernist long poem that is uh, also uses collage, um, and it's centered on Mount Rainier National Park. Um, it draws on um, language um, from the National Park Service and incorporates ideas from uh, John Muir and John Ruskin, and to my mind is kind of an underexamined environmental poem that, that is worthy of consideration. My second chapter focuses on the English writer, um, Mary Butts, particularly her Taverner novels and also her preservationist pamphlet, um, A Warning to Hikers. Um, while Butts isn't generally uh, read in the modernist canon or has been somewhat neglected, I'd encourage you to check out a really wonderful New Yorker article called um, Modernism's Forgotten Mystic, um, all about Butts. Um, and in this, in this chapter in particular, I situate her work alongside um, the, the work done by the Council for the Preservation of Rural England and also the National Trust. Um, and the, the fourth chapter that I'm outlining but haven't really made a lot of headway on is uh, um, centered on E.M. Forrester, in particular his uh, pageantry plays, which might seem like a strange place to go to investigate some of these issues, um, but I look at Abinger Harvest and also uh, England's Green and Pleasant Land. Um, both of these plays were actually produced for preservationist societies um, and, and I think are also worth investigating. So um, a kind of overview of how this, this chapter kind of situates into the dissertation as I've conceived of it uh, thus far. Okay, so let's get into it. In 1917, uh, one year after the United States government passed the Organic Act of 1916, which formalized the creation of the National Park Service, Harriet Monroe, the editor of Poetry, a magazine of verse, an all-around modernist tastemaker and power broker, argued that Americans should throw on civilization the blame for ugliness and go to the wilds to satisfy their unconquerable need of beauty. And out of this refreshment, this recreation in nature, I sometimes think that, that the race will be saved. Monroe articulates a form of national regeneration that occurs when Americans go to the wilds and turn away from civilization. Like important American environmentalists Fred, Frederick Law Olmsted and John Muir, Monroe places the reinvigoration and recreation of American national vitality within the wilds of the American landscape, specifically the wild nature that was becoming protected, developed, and managed by the National Park Service. In this chapter, I examine the modernist pastoral argument that defines nature as a retreat that will return and restore American national vitality in the era of modernity. This chapter firstly turns to a series of preservationist writings, 
specifically John Muir, Frederick Law Olmsted, and Teddy Roosevelt, that provide historical context for the idea of environmental rege regeneration and the correlated aesthetic appreciation that these uh, preservationists argued uh, was needed to access the vitality of nature. This chapter then turns to Harriet Monroe's editorials and poems from Poetry, a Magazine of Verse, in order to analyze how the discourse of regeneration informs modernist literary production and the political ideologies latent therein. The, third, the last third of this chapter turns to W.E.B. Du Bois' collection, Darkwater, Voices from Within the Veil, in order to deconstruct Monroe's environmental attitudes and to demonstrate their implications for modernism more broadly. In this chapter, I focus on Monroe and Du Bois' writing about the Grand Canyon National Park during the early 20th century. Where Monroe sees an open and vital frontier in the American desert, Du Bois personifies the Grand Canyon as a deep wound in the American national body politic, a wound that aesthetically vacillates between beauty and horror. At stake in both modernist examinations of the Grand Canyon, I argue, is the relationship uh, within environmental discourse between reactionary political projects and progressive aesthetic frameworks that sought to articulate newly emerging relationships between art and the environment in the era of modernity, precisely in response to the preservation of nature as the locus of national vitality and identity. Created in 1916, the National Park Service was a major step toward the preservation of nature in America. When the National Park Service defined its early preservation goals, a common idea was that parks should be national playgrounds. Frederick Law Olmsted, an important American landscape architect and preservationist advocate, defined parks as, quote, agencies for promoting public recreation and public health through the use and enjoyment of the parks and of the national, uh, natural scenery and objects of interest therein, end quote. National parks are thus conceived by Olmsted as, la as landscapes of retreat from modern cities and a return to the authentic frontier American experience. The construction of nature as a site of rest and renewal mobilizes a particular form of pastoral discourse rooted in the dialectic of retreat and return, wherein one goes into nature as, as uh, Terry Gifford has shown, in order to return to the city with insights and renewed mental, physical, and spiritual capacities. However, for these early American preservationists, such environmental retreats are sites of national rather than individual re reinvigoration that will return American culture to its supposed frontier roots of strength, self-sufficiency, and vitality. Reinvigoration was not merely a metaphor at the beginning of the 20th century. The closing of the American frontier in the 1890s um, as Roderick Nass has shown, led to a national anxiety that a lack of physical and psychological fitness that emerged from American engagement with the wild frontier would result in a devitalized and degenerating society. As Teddy Roosevelt put the matter, quote, the nation was facing the unhealthy softening and relaxation of fiber, which tend to accompany civilization, end quote. Combating such national atavism, Roosevelt argued, required the United States to, quote, preserve large tracts of wilderness as playgrounds for rich and poor alike, end quote. Like Roosevelt, Frederick Law Olmsted explicitly voiced some of the cultural worries over national atavism in the era of modernity. In his essay, The Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Big Tree Grove, published in 1865, Olmsted argued that exposing the nation to, quote, natural scenery gives the effect of refreshing rest and reinvigoration to the whole system. Olmsted points out that modern life, particularly what he identifies as business or household cares, yields, quote, softening of the brain, paralysis, palsy, monomania, or insanity, but more frequently of mental and nervous excitability, moroseness, melancholy, or irascibility, in incapacitating the subject for the proper exercise of the intellectual and moral forces, end quote. For Olmsted then, Getting back in touch with natural scenery was, quote, favorable to the health and vigor of men, and especially to the health and vigor of their intellect. In our national parks, John Muir similarly connects environmental preservation to American mental and spiritual vitality. Such an attitude is demonstrated in Muir's oft-quoted lines, which I see at places like REI, quote, thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home that wilderness is a necessity, and that mountain parks and reservations uh, are useful not only as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but as fountains of life 
Within early American environmental discourse, preserving nature was thus understood as a material and discursive project of preserving American national vitality and the democratic foundations of American society in the face of modernity and the perceived softening effects of modern culture on the national body politic. The anxiety and cures expressed by these American preservationists articulates a series of structural exclusions within the project of national regeneration. The discourse of softening as a result from over civilization is linked to patriarchal, patriarchal conceptions of gender um, and moreover the definition of national vitality at the core of this pastoral project is also ableist by suggesting that healthy bodies are only those that hike and camp in the American wilderness. What these anxieties as expressed by Olmsted, Muir and Roosevelt ultimately, ultimately suggest is not only a deep cultural fear over national atavism uh, as a result of modern life, but also that nature was exclusively the, the domain of white men. Linked to this white masculine discourse is a Manichaean worldview that, as Frantz Fanon puts it, quote, splits the world in two, end quote, namely the world of the colonizer and the colonized. For Olmsted, learning to appreciate and recognize the value of natural scenery was a key indicator of being civilized. Olmsted argued that, quote, among a thousand savages, there will be a much smaller number who will show the least sign of being so affected by natural scenery than among a thousand persons from a civilized community. This is only one of the many channels in which a similar distinction between civilized and savage men is to be generally observed. Pointing specifically to the connection between environmental aesthetics and being civilized, Olmsted argued that, quote, it is an important fact that as civilization advances, the interest of men in natural scenes of sublimity and beauty increases. So too does John Muir mobilize the binary discourse of civilized and savage in his text, My First Summer in the Sierra, particularly when discussing indigenous people. Reporting on a tribe in Glacier Meadow within Yosemite National Park, Muir observes that, quote, a strangely dirty and irregular life these dark-eyed, dark-haired, half-happy savages lead in this clean wilderness, end quote. Muir draws a distinction here between the strangely dirty indigenous people and the clean wilderness of the Yosemite area, suggesting that indigenous people are out of joint with the sublime landscape that they inhabit. Olmsted and Muir thus conceived of environmental regeneration as intimately connected to the preservation not only of national vitality, but also of a colonially, inf colonially informed conception of civilization. Both figures, who are rightly considered pioneers of the Western environmental movement, argue that returning to nature will reinvigorate the American body politic by providing aesthetic, aesthetic experiences that, in turn, are the wellspring of culture and civilization. Such reinvigoration, they argue, they argued was needed to combat the softening and what they saw as atavistic consequences of modern life. By extension, these landscapes and the Western traditions of environmental aesthetics that were used to understand them did not provide the regenerative, regenerative qualities to those who were deemed savage, which predominantly signified people of color, women, and persons uh, with disabilities. It is Harriet Monroe, the editor of Poetry, a Magazine of Verse, and tastemaker of American modernist aesthetics, who brought the arguments of environmental regeneration into the context of literary modernism. In the 1918 editorial essay titled The Great Renewal, Monroe articulates a similar idea of environmental regeneration as proposed by Olmsted and Muir. She writes, Mother Earth is the great renewer of the race, both physically and spiritually, but it would also be well if we were to search the platitude more deeply and realize that she is also the great renewer of the arts and that it is to her, rather than to schools and precedents of the past, that our artists, our poets, should go for their deep drafts of the nectar of the gods. Monroe also shares Olmsted and Muir's worry that the majority of Americans are over-civilized. Consider this statement from the great renewal. Groups and uh, as she writes, groups and races of men inherit too much from the super civilized past, even more than super civilized human beings. Do they need the great renewal from Mother Earth who bore them? What is clear is that Monroe, who was an instrumental curator, publicist, and editor of modernist poetics through her role at Poetry Magazine, which published influential modernists like Wallace Stevens and Ezra Pound, placed nature as the primary source of American artistic regeneration and American national artistic identity. Monroe champions the newly created national parks as the resource of national regeneration and as the fitting subject of modern art. 
quite controversially. In To the Wilderness, Monroe explicitly connected regeneration to the larger project of environmental preservation, arguing that, quote, our own inheritance of vast areas of mountain and desert, forest, lake, and seacoast, areas of which can never be civilized and which, in some cases, the government is preserving as national parks, may be regarded as our most precious possession, an ever-flowing fountain of youth for the nation. Monroe here echoes John Muir's claim that the wild landscapes protected within national parks are fountains of vitality for Americans. Not only would the parks provide national reinvigoration, Monroe argued, but Yellowstone, Yosemite, and Sequoia National Parks, among others, would become the source of American modern aesthetics. She argued that, quote, when we make these parks our own in spirit and truth, our art will cross the seas and our poems be on all men's tongues. Uh, Monroe puts this, this matter quite bluntly in The Great Renewal when she states that, quote, nature is the ultimate modernist. However, bringing modern art back to nature for Monroe entails an adoption of primitive art, particularly the art forms of Native Americans. In The Great Renewal, Monroe argued that, quote, the primitive art of this region and in primitive art so right, so expressive, our artists should slough off their sophistication and find that great renewal, which may energize the art of the world. End quote. Unlike uh, Olmsted's claim that the sublime and the beautiful were arbiters of culture, Monroe turns to primitive art and its connection to nature as the truest expression of the modern. Uh, yeah. A 1917 collection of poetry edited by Monroe entitled Aboriginal Poetry presented itself as, quote, an offering to our readers a number almost entirely devoted from, to poems from American Indian motives. Included in the collection were poems by Frank S. Gordon, Alice Corbin, Edward Eastaway, and Constance Lindsay Skinner, all non-Indigenous writers uh, who were appropriating Native American culture as an expression of the modern. Monroe herself identifies the extractive nature of this edition, in which she compares um, such cultures to, quote, the mine with its stores of treasure from a fading race. Moreover, Monroe's embrace of the primitive as a seat of modern aesthetic innovation resonates with modernists working across mediums, such as Picasso's use of African masks. Thus, the great renewal afforded by modernism's turn to wild landscapes constructs modernism within the colonial practices that both exoticized and silenced indigenous culture, cultures as primitive, practices which were also at the core of modernity itself. Monroe's preservationist arguments, which link together art, nationalism, and nature, uh, echo the argument of manifest destiny in relation to westward expansion, which saw the eradication of indigenous people from the landscape as an inevitable historical outcome. Consider Monroe's description of indigenous cliff dwellings and agricultural practices within the Grand Canyon as doomed to inevitable eradication. Writing in an essay, a 1902 essay uh, entitled Arizona, published within Atlantic Monthly, uh, Monroe writes, for the desert is old beyond one's dreams of age, not hierarchies and civilizations could fitly people it, but primeval man alone, barbarians cowering on their lofty mesas, savages scouring their thirsty plains, and yet hierarchies and civilizations shall surely inherit it, shall make the wilderness bloom as the rose and fill it with children and music and laughter. Of course, casting indigenous people as primitive barbarians outside of history is a form of essentialism that understands non-Western culture as explicitly non-modern and ahistorical, and thus unable to catch up to the hierarchies and civilizations of the industrial West. Monroe connects what she sees as the inevitable expansion and domination of the landscape to a conception of racial and cultural hierarchy, arguing that Quote, the savages must cease to be savage, the, the savage must cease to be savage, or he must pass away, or else he must perish from the earth and leave his kingdom to the stronger races. Monroe's conception of environmental regeneration and the correlated um, um, definition of the modern as rooted in the primitive that she articulates thus carries with it a troubling series of beliefs about national and racial identity. These colonial attitudes are present not only in Monroe's editorial work but also in the aesthetics she relies upon to describe the Grand Canyon in her prose and poetry, particularly her use of the sublime. As Richard Grusin has shown, nearly all writing about the Grand Canyon can be understood as an expression of what he terms cognitive inaccessibility, wherein the major, sub major subject of any text or artwork about the canyon itself is, is centered on the artist's inability to fully grasp and in turn to uh, um, 
not be able to render the landscape present within their work. Um, and Grusin connects this idea to a tradition of the romantic sublime in particular. Monroe's work reflect, similarly reflects a radical and threatening inaccessibility within the Arizona desert. In her essay, The Grand Canyon of the Colorado, published in Atlantic Monthly, Monroe details a trip she took to the area at the turn of the 20th century in which she describes the Grand Canyon as a threatening uh, natural force. Focusing on the scale of the canyon, which is really common in all of the writing about this particular landscape, Monroe points out that, quote, the immense and endless desolation seem to efface us from the earth. What right have we there on these lofty lands, which never since the beginning of time had offered sustenance to man? Monroe here seems to express um, a, a form of the sublime, but does not transcend the natural power of the Grand Canyon through the intellect as Kant's formula dictates. Instead, the canyon is a specter of death that continually threatens to efface her from the landscape. Monroe goes so far as to articulate a suicidal impulse upon encountering the power of the Grand Canyon and its scale. Quote, my narrow ledge of rock was a prison. I fought against the desperate temptation to fling myself down into that soft abyss and thus redeem the affront which the eager beating of my heart offered to its inviolable solitude. Death itself would not be too rash an apology for my invasion. The days of my wanderings along the chasm of uh, along the edge of the chasm were too few to reconcile my littleness with its immensity. To the end, it effaced me. Describing her encounter with the Grand Canyon as an invasion, Monroe repeats the idea that the landscape has effaced her, suggesting a, a sublime experience without any kind of transcendence. Monroe again contends with the power of the Grand Canyon in the poem At O'Neill's Point, which was published in a 1922 editor, excuse me, edition of poetry. However, rather than an emphasis on death and erasure, Monroe focuses her attention on the first European explorers to explore the Grand Canyon, Garcia Lopez de Carreñas in 1540. Monroe describes this expedition in the poem as such. Cardenas, I salute you. You, marauding, buccaneering Spaniard. You, ragged and swarded lordling, slashing through to the seven cities of Chibola. You, a thirst in the desert, seeking to drink from the great river, the mother of Western seas, the Colorado River, dear to your Hopi guides. You, Cardenas the Spaniard, three centuries before the next first white man, you with your handful of starvelings stood on this rim of the Grand, of, stood on this rim of the canyon. The tone of Mo Monroe's poem is seemingly reverential. Cardenas, continually evoked through direct address, is celebrated as a picaresque adventurer who through his marauding and buccaneering eschews the law and social convention in the name of exploration and discovery. As the National Park Service points out on their Grand Canyon website, Cardenas, Cardenas and his party were the first white explorers to discover the Grand Canyon, but were unable to reach the Colorado River and ultimately gave up their westward search, leaving the Grand Canyon to remain, as the National Park Service points out, unexplored for 235 years. Monroe's At O'Neill's Point recreates this moment of westward exploration and discovery. She writes, here where I stand, you stood on the rim of the world. You saw these sky-wrapped towers, these terraces, purple temples, august and terrible, and over them, over, you gazed at the celestial city and counted the steps of gods on its ramparts and saw the great white throne, all pearl and moonstone beyond through the turquoise gates. In this moment of the poem, Monroe imagines herself in Cardenia's exact position overlooking the Grand Canyon nearly half a millennium before. The poem takes on the perspective of Cardenas and envisions the landscape through his eyes, again emphasizing direct address. What's remarkable is that the Grand Canyon, from Cardenas' perspective as appropriated by Monroe within the poem, is no longer a source of effacement due to the inscrutability of the landscape and its enormous scale, but instead becomes a symbol of the transcendent power of colonial expansion and exploration. In these last lines, Monroe allows Cardenas to look over and beyond the landscape to the celestial city, wherein the Grand Canyon becomes analogous to the gates of heaven. Where her early writing on the Grand Canyon foregrounds the dynamic sublime without, a, without any transcendence, Monroe's writing from 1922 instead celebrates a seemingly transcendent colonial project of European explorers who have discovered the Grand Canyon. 
The shift in Monroe's writing from 1899 to 1922 suggests that the romantic uplifting of nature as a source of national regeneration relies upon an aesthetic framework of sublime of the sublime that is at its core um, rooted in a colonial epistemology, an epistemology that constructs the land as undiscovered until it has been viewed and recorded by white explorers. In turn, Monroe's reliance upon the national parks and the wilderness they protect as sources of modernist aesthetic innovation latently links modernism um, to a colonial framework. What is ultimately the most troubling about Monroe's work is her ability to see the life of nature within the national parks and the vitality that they offer while simultaneously being blinded to the life of the um, eradicated and excluded human communities who have historically inhabited the landscapes within them. All right, shifting gears a little bit. During the 1922 National Parks Conference that took place in Yosemite National Park, debates were taking place over park accessibility and development. A slogan proposed by the superintendent of Rocky Mountain National Park, Roger W. Toll, was for, quote, adequate development, but against overdevelopment, end quote. Among the issues examined during this conference were the role of roads and the proper balance to strike so that the, that the park should be, quote, popular, but never commonplace. While the new leaders of the National Park Service debated the best policies regarding the balance between preservation and development, a striking comment was made regarding black visitors to the parks. Quote, one of the objections to colored people is that if they come in large groups, they will be conspicuous and will not only be objected to by other visitors, but will cause trouble among the hotel and camp help, and it will be impossible to serve them. Individual cases can be handled, although even this is awkward, but organized parties could not be taken care of. While we cannot openly discriminate against them, they should be told that parks have no facilities for taking care of them. Within the context of the pastoral justification of parks as sources of environmental regeneration, these comments from the 1922 National Parks Conference, um, the same year that Monroe published at O'Neill's Point, suggests that the renewal offered within these landscapes is a predominantly white resource. As William O'Brien has shown in Landscapes of Exclusion, the, land, the, uh, the landscapes protected by the National Park Service were often understood as white space. Similarly, Carolyn Merchant has argued that, quote, sublime nature was white and benign, available to white tourists. The spectacular national parks of the West, such as Yosemite, Yellowstone, and Glacier, were increasingly viewed as an escape for those white Americans who could afford the trip, end quote. Carolyn Finney in her Black Faces, White Spaces um, further puts this issue in, in stark terms. Quote, national parks and forests as spaces and places that reflect national identity, environmental values, and American history are not immune to processes of representation and racialization. In particular, national parks and forests can unintentionally become sites where African-Americans experience insecurity, exclusion, and fear born out of historical precedent, collective memory, and contemporary concerns. What O'Brien, Merchant, and Finney demonstrate is not only a troubling environmental history of race-based exclusions from the landscapes that made America, quote, nature's nation, but also that the discourse of environmental regeneration reflects a politics of whiteness that mobilizes nature as a resource of exclusion racial vitality. W.E.B. Du Bois' Darkwater, Voices from Within the Veil, published in 1920, explicitly examines the pastoral justification of national parks um, central to Monroe's work in particular, and also within American culture more broadly. Darkwater is an experimental collection of essays, poems, hymns, speculative fiction, and sociological analysis. If you haven't read it, I'd encourage you to do so. It's wonderful. Um, written during the period of transatlantic high modernism, Darkwater displays many stylistic characteristics of modernist art. Given the modernist context of Du Bois' work, uh, Darkwater is a rich text to examine the limitations of environmental regeneration within the context of literary modernism. Darkwater explicitly takes up the issues of the pastoral, the sublime, and American nature in national parks through modernist stylistic techniques that, I argue, defamiliarize Monroe's modernist pastoral. Such defamiliarization emerges through what Du Bois develops as a, a doubling of environmental representation that represents wild nature as a source of transcendence, i.e. the sublime, and also as the locus of racial inequality and historical violence. <clears throat> 
While Dark Water contains many important texts from Du Bois corpus, including The Souls of White Folk and Of Work and Wealth, a less examined essay entitled Of Beauty and Death contains extended passages on several prominent environmental themes. Du Bois begins his analysis of the national parks in a beauty and death through an appeal to the treat with, retreat within parks, excuse me, as a form of environmental regeneration, uh, asking, quote, why do not those who are scarred in the world's battle and hurt by its hardness travel to these places of beauty and drown themselves in the utter joy of life, end quote. Du Bois here articulates a series of discursive components of pastoral discourse and environmental regeneration that we've already seen in the work of Muir, Olmsted, and Monroe. Namely, nature is a space for revitalization from the modern world that can be accessed through exposure to and appreciation of natural beauty. However, Du Bois defamiliarizes the pastoral discourse of early environmental preservation within dark water and throughout dark, dark water by deconstructing the idea of nature in American culture. The National Park Service, for example, has often relied upon conceptions of wilderness that cast nature as empty, virgin, and pristine. As Timothy Morton has pointed out, these definitions of nature construct the environment in binary terms, wherein the real nature is always out there in parks, woods, and wilderness. Rather than identifying nature as wild land, Du Bois demonstrates that nature can also signify environmental exposure to pollution, for example. Du Bois situates this expanded identification of nature within the pastoral discourse, again, of retreat and return, particularly in regard to travel by rail. As Marguerite Schaefer has shown in her wonderful text, See America First, the railroads were instrumental to the, to the development and success of the National Park Service in the 20th century. Rails like the Great Northern made many of the parks accessible to a growing American middle class with the time and resources for recreation and leisure. However, Du Bois, using direct address, demonstrates the reprehensible inequality that black passengers experienced when traveling to the American wilderness through his examination of the Jim Crow car. Du Bois writes that, quote, the Jim Crow car is up next the baggage car and engine. It stops out beyond the covering in the rain or sun or dust. Usually there is no step to help you climb on and often the car is a smoker cut in two and you must pass through the white smokers or else they pass through your part with swagger and noise and stares. Your compartment is a half or a quarter or an eighth of the oldest car in service on the road. Unless it happens to be a thorough express, the plush is caked with dirt, the floor is grimy and the windows dirty. It is difficult to get lunch or clean water. Rather than experience nature within the parks, those who are aboard the Jim Crow car ex are exposed to environmental conditions like rain or sun or dust. Um, they're also exposed to these conditions within the car itself, such as dirt and grime. And as Du Bois points out, are unable to acquire clean water and clean air. Du Bois thus defamiliarizes environmental discourse that foregrounds the pastoral as a site of regeneration through an exposure to and travel to wild nature within the parks by expanding the awareness of nature as environmental exposure when one is retreating to wild nature. The pastoral discourse in A Beauty and Death thus doubles environmental perception that presents nature as both a site of liberation and an expression of inequality. In A Beauty and Death, uh, du Bois also defamiliarizes the sublimity of Grand Canyon and Acadia National Parks through literary techniques of doubling that again articulate the way that nature is both a, a space of sublime transcendence and also a locus of imminent historical violence. Like Monroe's writing about the Grand Canyon, Du Bois grapples with the linguistic and cognitive failure to reckon with the scale and novelty of the landscape drawing on recognizably touchstone features of the sublime. Consider Du Bois' struggle with adequate and appropriate language to evoke and represent the canyon. Quote, is yonder wall a hedge of black or is it the rampart between heaven and hell? I see greens. Is it moss or giant pines? I see specks that might be boulders. So too does Du Bois seem to evoke the struggle for recognition and representation of the canyon when he writes, quote, it is a grim thing, unholy, terrible. It is not red and blue and green. But ah, the shadows and shades of all the world, glad colorings touched with a spiritual, a hesitant spiritual delicacy. What does it mean? What does it mean? Consider also the description of the Grand Canyon that Du Bois presents as a symbolic representation of violence. 
uh, here's his, his writing on, on the landscape, quote, it is a sudden void in the bosom of the earth down to its entrails, a wound where the dull titanic knife has turned and twisted in the hole, leaving its edges livid, scarred, jagged, and pulsing over the white and red and purple of its mighty flesh, while down below, down, down below, in black and severed vein, <clears throat> excuse me, boils the dull and sullen flood of the Colorado. Du Bois again echoes many common tropes of the sublime through his attention to scale and power of the land, pointing out that the canyon is a sudden void that defies comprehension. And yet the primary symbol that Du Bois offers is that of nature as a wound that has exposed the severed vein of the Colorado River. If we follow the preservationist logic as articulated by Monroe and others, that the national parks are emblematic of America itself, then Du Bois constructs a wounded nation through the symbolic evocation of the Grand Canyon. As Rob Nixon has shown in Slow Violence, pastoral discourses long cast nature as an ahistorical and timeless wild landscape that exudes sublime aesthetic qualities outside the context of human culture. Against this form of perception, Nixon advocates for what he calls environmental double consciousness that tracks nature as both sublime and violent in order to, as he says, quote, reinsert the violence into view, end quote. In striking terms, Nixon outlines the duality of perception at the core of environmental double consciousness. He writes that environmental double consciousness is a tranquility simultaneously expressed and exploded through an ongoing history of the present that is violently, inextricably societal and natural. To feel the convergent impulses behind post-colonial pastoral's historical double take in an African-American pastoral that uh, prompts us to see beyond some immediate, immediately bucolic calm, the domestic terrorism Long in, view, long in view. Du Bois further articulates environmental double consciousness within Of Beauty and Death, specifically while concluding the section on the sublimity of Acadia National Park. While viewing the sunset upon Mount Desert and the coastline, Du Bois reports that, quote, above the calm and gold green moon, beneath the wind wet earth, and here alone, my soul enchained, enchanted. These observations again reflect touchstone features of the sublime, particularly the attention to transcendence, the solitude of the speaker, and the enchanting quality of the landscape. However, the sublime, the sublime scene excuse me, is also enchaining for the speaker. As Du Bois points out, quote, both things are true and both belong to this our world and neither can be denied, end quote. And yet the environmental double consciousness developed by Du Bois in Darkwater not only critiques American preservationist discourse centered upon an ahistorical and apolitical construction of wilderness that, as we saw earlier, is intimately linked to racial and colonial politics. Du Bois also defamiliarizes preservationist discourse centered on wild nature by identifying what we might call urban ecologies as an authentic locus of nature and also as a powerful source of national vitality. In describing New York City from the vantage of the Brooklyn Bridge, Du Bois reports that, quote, New York and night from the Brooklyn Bridge, the bees and fireflies flit and twinkle in their vast hives, Curves, uh, curved clouds like the breath of gods hover between the towers and the moon. One hears the hiss of lightnings, the deep thunder of human things, and a fevered breathing as of some attendant and invisible pow invincible powers. The glow of burning millions melts outward into a dim and fairy outline until afar the liquid music born of rushing crowds drips like a benediction on the sea." End quote. Du Bois' description of New York City does not, draw, does not draw attention to modern technologies like cars, airplanes, and skyscrapers. Instead, the people of the city are, le are likened to bees and fireflies. Moreover, the elemental forces of nature, such as lightning, clouds, the sea, rather than cultural products of modernity, are central to Du Bois' writing about New York City. Even though Du Bois stands upon the Brooklyn Bridge, a supposed symbol of modernity's power over nature, the bridge is instead harmonized with the landscape of the city. In this description, Du Bois demonstrates that culture is naturalized as a site of nature. And in this way, Du Bois anticipates the now famous critiques of wilderness as articulated by the environmental historian, William Cronin in his wonderful essay, The Trouble with Wilderness. In conclusion, um, Monroe and Du Bois turn back to the earth as a source of national and aesthetic regeneration might best be thought of as a battleground for modernism itself. T.E. Hume's Romanticism and Classicism, an important text for the theorization of modernist aesthetics, uh, rejected any turn back to nature as a form of romantic anti-modern nostalgia. Ezra Pound, of course, shared Hume's view of nature um, in regard to modernism. In the Little Review, uh, Pound argued that, quote, I cannot believe that the mere height of the Rocky Mountains will produce lofty poetry. I cannot believe that the mere geographical expanse of America will produce of itself excellent writing, excuse me. <clears throat> 
What's unique in reading Monroe alongside Du Bois is the radically different political projects that nature is yielded towards within the context of literary modernism. Monroe yokes, and as we've seen, excuse me, Monroe yokes environmental regeneration to a colonial epistemology and thereby brings something akin to scientific racism to bear on issues of nature in the context of modernism. Du Bois, by contrast, demonstrates the way in which the environment has been historically used as a tool of marginalization. And yet both figures present these environmental attitudes through a distinctly modernist set of artistic strategies, concerns, and contexts. Perhaps rather than resolve these tensions, we might instead recognize that such contradictory impulses reflect the dialectic between modernism and modernity itself. More broadly, in 1983, Wallace Stegner provided the National Park Service with a motto that has stuck to this day, the parks are America's best idea. However, the entirety of Stegner's quote is less often uh, cited, which goes as follows. National parks are the best idea we ever had, absolutely American, absolutely democratic. They reflect us at our best rather than our worst. Situating these writers within the explicit and latent uh, racism and colonial epistemologies that took root during the rise of environmental preservation requires, I think, a deconstruction of how we understand public land in America, in American culture. Um, I think these authors ask us to, to question, who is the public that is interpolated into America's best idea? Um, and as I've tried to show, Monroe and du, work, du Bois' work suggests that the nature within public lands is the domain of a predominantly white, masculine, able-bodied public. Examining literary modernism within this context thus um, provides envir contemporary environmental discourse, not only with new modes of environmental representation that help to attend to the liberary and entangling and chaining entanglements of nature and culture, but also serves as a warning against reifying the exclusionary practices and ideologies that have been foundational to preservationist thinking since its inception at the turn of the 20th century. Thank you. Here's my work side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, thank you. I'm going to change back to our gallery view so we can all see you. Um, thank you very much for that. So I will be facilitating um, questions and answers and keeping a queue of comments and questions for Sean. I'm seeing mostly the applause icon, but I'll invite you to raise your little raise hand icon or your actual physical hand. So is there anyone who would like to get us started? Okay, I see Sharnell. Thank you. Um, who's another one of our valued PhD uh, candidate fellows here with us this term. Charnel. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. I really enjoyed this presentation and I love getting to hear it in your voice after reading, um, reading some of the work last week. So um, yeah, just thank you so much for the kind of really great work you're doing, tying in a lot of these important conversations about anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity and nationalism. Um, and I'm wondering, so I, I really appreciated the part about um, Du Bois talking about, and your analysis of Du Bois text, thinking about um, elements of nature being inside of the kind of like industrialized space of the, of the car. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you also in this, in this chapter or in other chapters are thinking about the way that kind of industrialization or industrial tools or modern tools are being introduced into kind of these or imposed onto these natural landscapes. Um, so when you see like people writing about um, white folks, especially writing about going out into these places, um, do you see kind of those tools and industrialization also following into the spaces? Charnel, thank you so much for that question. I really appreciate that. And that is something that is really at the center of my, uh, uh, work on, um, on Marianne Moore in particular. Um, I don't know if anyone's read the poem, but there's she, she has this really slippery metaphor of, of an octopus that she uses to kind of represent Mount Rainier. Um, and, and within the work that I've done and, and uh, looking at the kind of tracing back the, the citations for the collage that she employs, she, she likens the octopus to like um, calamari is like this consumable 
resource. Um, also, this, the way in which the um, um, as Na Mount Rainier National Park was being created, um, it's it's likened to like the the industrial forces on it are likened to like an octopus that are like reaching out all of their fingers onto all of the natural landscapes. And one of the things that I'm trying to point out within that. Uh, that chapter is that more is actually quite critical of the way that industrialism is actually impacting and developing those national parks and is doing so through this really slippery metaphor of the octopus. Um, there, there's also um, in, in, in Mary Butt's work in particular, um, uh, I think a fear of, of, of the modern, Jeff might be able to speak to this a, a bit more, but the way in which um, there's this wonderful poem called Corf in which she's hiking in what she calls the sacred South um, and is talking about like, keep all of these um, Americans and English and Scotsmen out and keep the trains out of this landscape. And so violently rejecting this industrialism within these landscapes. So there is this really, I think, contentious relationship between development and industry um, in the national parks is reflected in this archive, absolutely. Okay. Um, oh, good. I'm not on mute. I see Danielle next. Danielle. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. I really enjoyed reading your paper and listening to this talk. And um, yeah, I I hadn't I I had never known of this um, Du Bois text, so that was really exciting and interesting for me to to learn about that and see your analysis of it. So I just wanted to shout that out as something that I really liked. Um, and as an environmental humanities scholar, this is really important and um, relevant work. So I have a, a kind of pure curiosity question and maybe outside of the scope of your project, but um, I'm curious if there are indigenous modernist writers yeah. that were um, resisting or, or, or speaking against this kind of dominant um, modernism that, um, that you've spoken to. I mean, I certainly know of kind of indigenous authors in, in later periods, I tend to be much more familiar with contemporary writings or you know, maybe since the eighties or something like that, not very long ago. Um, and so, yeah, it's really just a curiosity if you've come across um, any, any of those authors in your work. Thank you for that question, Danielle. I, I sadly have not, and it's not from a lack of, of searching. It's not something that I've, I've come across, um, but it is something that I think um, absolutely would be really beneficial for this project as I'm kind of one of the larger things that I'm trying to do is, is uh, in a contribution to the new modernist studies is to try to kind of destabilize how we think about um, modernist kind of archives, who's counted as a modernist and why they're counted as modernists and, and the, the value of their work in, the, in that regard. Um, but I have not come across any of these texts. Um, I would love to, um, to, to find some though, and that's something I'm, I'm very interested in. Okay, and next we have Katharina, who is a member of our fellowship community as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sean. This was great. What I, the many things I love actually is that we have sort of our conversation first with the fellows, and then we get to hear the talk again, sort of second time around. It typically you get even more out of it. And I think you did a wonderful job presenting it here. So really appreciated that. I think you already talked about this a little bit, but I just want to hear uh, more. What about the issue of gender? Because I mean, women clearly were. Um, part of the modernist movement, we're thinking Virginia Woolf, who of course also had her issues with the room of her own, which she did or did not have and wanted access to certainly. How do you account for that? Because I mean, what you're describing here with the national parks is a white project, but it's also ultimately seems to me a pretty male project. On the other hand, of course, you have women writers here. I mean, you, your examples were today limited to the sort of American side of things, uh, women writers who participate in this. So I would just like to hear a little bit more how you think through this, how you theorize um, this, and also the, the intersectionality, I guess, between race and gender. Are there any Black women um, who participate in this discourse at all. So I just sort of like to hear a little bit more because I assume it's going to be a pretty important aspect of your project. And again, thank you. It was a great presentation. Well, thank you so much for that question. And before I talk more specifically about the relationship between gender and nature, I want to say that um, 
Wolf also has a really contentious relationship, I think, to, to gender, right? She just, she really leans on the figure of, of androgyny in particular, seems to um, not be wholeheartedly embracing this, 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 this uh, identity category. But I think you're absolutely right that gender is, is a very large part of, this, of this, this issue. And to be honest, it wasn't something that was, it should have been, but it wasn't on the forefront of my mind until the workshop and it was pointed out to me just how important these issues are. Um, and, and I think in particular, it's kind of, uh, just within the context of this chapter, I haven't fully theorized it, um, but thinking about the way that Monroe as this modernist tastemaker is, is echoing these white masculine discourses and situating those as her definition of, of, of kind of modernism and, and of modernist aesthetics more broadly. I think that's, that's a, a quite a unique perspective that I haven't fully kind of unpacked at this, at this current moment. Um, but you're absolutely right that, um, and as, as Leslie had pointed out in our, in our conversation, um, last week that this is something that needs to be um, theorized and thought through more. Um, and so at this moment, I, I don't have um, a solid response to it, just to say that I recognize the importance of it. And I think it's really going to complicate some of these discourses. And I think really situating Monroe um, a, as a woman within these, these um, white masculine discourses, I think might be a really fruitful place to kind of maybe nuance some of the reading that I've done of Monroe's work. But thank you for bringing that again to my attention. Wonderful. Before our next um, hand raise, I just wanted to point to um, a contribution in the chat from another member of our community, uh, fellowship community, Leslie, um, resonating with the previous question. Yes, really resonating with that question and the intertwined historical construction of whiteness, masculinity, and hyperbatable bodiedness. And as you um, shared, this conversation has expanded um, your thinking on how to think about this set of materials you've collected. Um, she continues, I wonder too, oh, there she is. She can just say, do you wanna? Oh, oh. I don't yeah. have much to say beyond that. Like, um, I think like rather than lifting up Du Bois too as like the solution to that problem, um, that there's a possibility of like doing some really interesting queer reading of that work that like both reproduces that sort of, uh, masculine relationship to nature, but also has the possibility of disrupting it through to through the um, complex an analysis of race, but also of the body, like just, yeah, thinking through, this is a very unthought out idea, because I have actually haven't read that Du Bois piece, but I want to now to be like, where does it reproduce the issues you're talking about in the earlier pieces? And where does it maybe like create some relief? And, and just one more on this collection of materials. Um, Susan, who's a valued member of our team at Tanner, makes the observation that Sean, such an interesting collection of primary source material gathered and interpreted in new ways. And I, I hope that from our engagements, there are newer ways and additional ways one might interpret the work. So Leslie's suggestion that maybe we problematize Du Bois and you have inspired me to read that. I hadn't been familiar with that work previously. Um, we are joined by um, my co-conspirator. I see Jeff McCarthy with the hand. He is the director of environmental humanities, and I understand a member of your dissertation committee. Jeff, welcome. Hey everybody, can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, thanks, thanks. Yeah, great to um, great to see everyone. Um, and I emailed Sean some um, some comments on uh, on these ideas and, and emailed him a bunch of praise uh, also. I, I think um, I'll comment briefly on this question of indigenous uh, modernists. Um, I, I, basically, modernists, European and American, were busy poaching uh, from indigenous uh, art, right? So if we think about um, Picasso's uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, or we think about D.H. Lawrence's so-called primitivism uh, and his time in Taos. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of this modernism is, um, instead of including uh, um, uh, indigenous voices, is um, you know, borrowing would be a generous word uh, for, for, that, um, for that work. Um, it's not until I think you get into the um, uh, a, a little later that you see more indigenous artists um, uh, showing up in that modernist um, so-called experimental uh, realm. And, and I think it's not that people weren't there. I think they're more just like excluded from, um, from view by things like um, the, the stuff we saw in Poetry Magazine. I really love the work you're doing with 
um, uh, texts like um, Poetry Magazine and, and mixing these artifacts with um, uh, direct texts from things like the National Park Service. I, I, I think that um, uh, ho holding those two things up um, together uh, offers some pretty powerful uh, cultural readings. So um, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to keep doing that and, and being um, overt about that, like, like making it clear that that's, that that's an intention that you have, have set and are realizing. Um, similarly, I, I think it's important to emphasize that the American and European modernist traditions are quite different. And uh, I know you and I have talked about that, but as you move towards trying to publish this work, um, I, I, I would ask you to, uh, to foreground some of those differences, particularly in relation to um, attitudes towards nature. And, and you gestured towards this a little bit with Hume, um, but um, you, you know, the, the kinds of nature as regeneration, nature as seat of, uh, of insight and health, that we see in National Park Service work um, uh, and some of Monroe's stuff in the early 20th century it is quite the opposite of what gets presented by, um, for instance, the Italian futurists um, and uh, one of their collections uh, in like 1910 called Let's Murder the Moonshine, um, which is an absolute re refutation of um, romantic uh, ideas. Um, at the same time, you have the British vorticists uh, celebrating um, uh, uh, machinery um, and speed uh, instead of um, uh, sort of the natural world. They're just sick of, I mean, they're making it new by saying like all this Wordsworth stuff is passe, yeah. we've got to do a stay. Um, you see that as well in the in the problematizing of the pastoral, um, where people go off into the woods or go off into the jungle or go up a river, and instead of returning improved, they become Mr. Kurtz. Uh, and, and so there is this long tradition in the European setting of um, a suspicion and kind of like finding this romantic tradition tedious and needing to distinguish themselves exactly from that. So that's not a problem for your thesis, so long I think as you do, uh, or this is a place where I think national um, boundaries within the study are uh, productive, or, or at least kind of announcing those, um, uh, announcing the, that you're conscious um, of, of those boundaries. And, and I think you are. Um, I love the stuff on Du Bois. I, I think this Enchained and Enchanted um, a phrase that you, that you have um, that you borrow from him uh, is really productive for you. Um, and, and so I, I think this chapter um, is off to a, a powerful start. So um, kudos. Uh, other people may have have insights on those on those same sets of ideas. So this is less a this is less a question and, and more a kind of sharing of, of thoughts that you uh, evoked. So thanks. Okay. Um, I don't see any more. I think Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy. Hi, Sean. Thanks for this. Um, I really think it was a terrific presentation. I, I want to just compliment you. Um, I think you and, and a number of other fellows, Charnel, and you know, have really impressed me with uh, just the presentation aspects of your work on Zoom. I think it's not easy to give a talk. Uh, in this medium and and your presentation was was really lucid and and the visuals are great and um, I you know I also want to reiterate my compliment from last week which is really that I think you're you're offering such a rich and new archive to us and I want to you know I, I still want like a little more storytelling about the the poetry magazine uh, context of uh, where these essays um, appear because I think you really are kind of presenting something that you know we didn't know was in that those famous numbers of poetry. Um, um, I, I wanna kind of ask you to elaborate on um, how you think your work does kind of make us rethink what we would think of as kind of canonical accounts of modernism, because it is a surprising archive and it's a surprising um, set of discourses in a number of ways. And, I, and I'm thinking of like at least two angles. 
I mean, first of all, I think we often think of modernism as really wedded in its high forms to urban environments, you know, the wasteland, Mrs. Dalloway, Ulysses. Um, and secondly, those urban environments are kind of indicative of uh, kind of um, an overwhelming amount of sensory information, which yeah. poses a serious epistemological problem. Yeah. How do we know and make coherent the world? Um, how can we achieve a stable meaning? Um, and, you know, it seems to me that the canonical account in my reading is that modernist uh, aesthetic devices are efforts to kind of make legible that problematic. We have limits of perspectives or multiple perspectives. We have fragmentation and that those, those aesthetic forms are ways of rendering a universe that doesn't resolve into some sort of coherent meaning. But what you're pointing to are sort of, you know, they seem almost kind of retrograde efforts to kind of make the world legible or, or um, coherent. They kind of offer kind of, uh, you, you use the word transcendental, um, kind of grounding. If we just go to nature, you know, Pounds is maybe a little more skeptical of this, but if we go out to nature, <laughs> Um, we will be regenerated. There will be some kind of purity. And so I wonder if you want to kind of speak to that and, and if that's something that, you know, you hope to do in the dissertation is kind of um, position these sort of answers that nature is a kind of refuge or retreat or some kind of regenerating force. Does that emerge as a kind of answer to the certain kinds of problems that modernist writers are wrestling with in the first place. Jeremy, you, you've asked so many good and rich and, and important questions. And as you were talking about this, this kind of like barrage of sensory experience, I'm thinking of reading Ulysses, which is like all about those paratactic sentences. We have so many different narratives, styles. We have so many different speakers. That book is so confusing that it requires often multiple guidebooks to make it through in the Joyce seminars that I've taken, right, with the illusions and, and with what's happening. So I think you're absolutely right that modernist style in particular is responding to this kind of barrage of the modern. Um, I, I think that's, that's very true. Um, but I also, the, the first point that, that you make uh, about um, the, the ways that we view modernism generally is connected to things like urbanism, celebration of technology, celebration of machinery. Um, I think all of these things are certainly um, true. And, and I think following um, uh, work by Jeff, by Elizabeth Black, by Kelly Soltzbeck, one of the things I'm trying to point out um, within this archive that I'm reading is that nature is actually one of the central grounds in which modernists are trying to kind of understand and think through uh, what it means to be modern, what modernist aesthetics are all about, and that actually this kind of marginalization of nature within kind of modernist studies criticism is actually um, kind of overlooking a really rich archive, whether it be Lawrence's work um, in like Pan in America, whether it be these archives that we're looking at here today, um, um, Marianne Moore's work on Mount Rainier National Park. I do think that these modernists, while they're um, like often not considered environmental writers at all, actually have a lot to contribute. And so I do think that that is one of the contributions um, that I'm trying to make. Um, and the last point that you, you brought up is this idea of kind of searching for totality, um, maybe by turning in into nature. And, and one of the things that my advisor, Vince, has, has always pointed me towards is the way that, that modernists um, uh, generate these grand mythologies that often lead to really slippery political projects like fascism um, and some other things that are really um, th these grand narratives that that become really troubling um, and I'm not so sure that 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 necessarily nature is 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 the resolving force, but rather, as I was trying to point out in this chapter, as we read Monroe alongside Du Bois, and and I, I take the points about maybe problematizing my reading of Du Bois, um, that they 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 offer contentious, um, radically different kind of ways of looking at nature and, and the modern. So they're not really resolving into this into this totality that you're describing. In fact, it's kind of um, turtles all the way down, so to speak. And so I think this, this tension as something you and Jim brought up also in the workshop is something that I'm working um, to try to more clearly articulate the way that it almost becomes a dialectical relationship between, between modernism and, and modernity more broadly. Um, but I, I really like the points that, that you've brought up. And those are things that I think I still need to really tackle and think more, more about as I move forward, not only with the introduction, but with the final chapters. Okay, um, I wanna draw attention to an extended comment in the chat from Julie. Um, this was following up on Jeff's comment and we did have an exchange about 
different types of nature, different landscapes. I'd ask you about, well, Australia, other colonial. So um, Julie, I don't know if you wanna intervene on that point. Yeah, I can. I mean, I'm much more articulate in, uh, <laughs> when I write it down than when I ask a question in person. Um, but yeah, just sort of, um, I know Katarina brought this up last week too, um, pushing you a little bit more and then Jeff just mentioned on the, the comparative aspects between Britain uh, or the English case and the American case, um, you know, what's distinctive between them, what it perhaps overlaps, but then also thinking beyond the American or the US Anglo context, what sort of similarities might you see in modernism and approaches to nature. And I just wanted to highlight, for example, uh, the work of Aldo Leopold, right, who is a German American who spends a significant amount of time in Germany including during the 30s, hint, hint, hint. Um, and so that there really is a larger transnational context here, transatlantic at least, um, to a lot of this rhetoric. Um, and so when you're sort of making the case for significance um, in the dissertation or thinking about publishing, that might be irrelevant um, for you to, to draw in. Yeah, Julie, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I wasn't aware of that context with Aldo Leopold, but I am a huge fan of San, San County Almanac. That's one of my um, favorite texts. And the, and the land ethic has been quite important to me as I think about environmental issues. And, and I think that this, this larger idea of transnationalism that a number of comments have pushed me toward, I think also resonates with a lot of the, the, the kind of cutting edge scholarship for, for the new modernist studies that it's often synonymous with like the transnational turn. And so I think that in this way, um, as, as I start to think more about these issues, which which obviously are, are kind of a blind spot in, in the project as it stands or under theorized and needs to be more foregrounded will allow my work to maybe speak to some of these more contemporary trends in, in, in this larger field. So thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. Okay, another excellent point and intervention from Charnel. I don't know if you care to share that one verbally. Um, Sean, you now know how to save the chat. And I think um, you might wanna do that again here. Um, but but she is raising, um, again, complimenting what this is doing, but Jeff's comment or intervention was pretty generative because here's another one following up, um, made me think of this discourse not only as a nationalist project, but also as a specifically Western one, which you mentioned. And I'm, I'm now kind of thinking about African literature that I've read and I, I haven't really thought about the lens of, anyway, but other bodies of literature maybe. Um, honing in on the regional aspects might also help you think about the relationship between anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity in the environmental landscape, i.e. Indigenous, indigenous folks were stripped of land and removed, no, there was a project, um, to the West and Black people were excluded from movements to the West and contained in the South um, because of racial terror and inhibited mobility and um, lawyer here, realms of segregation and space legally mandated was quite clear. Um, and the West still remains very much a white place, just like the national parks. Yeah. So, um, uh, and then Jeff saw that. So yeah, I think these are pushing in a direction to maybe expand um, your analysis of some of these texts, problematize them. And I think you're, Charno, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, even when I think about like D.H. Lawrence writing like in the American Southwest, and I'm thinking about these writers who are also writing about like a very Western landscape, the Grand Canyon, I think you're absolutely right that this isn't only a nationalist project, but is very much, or a nationalist discourse, but is also very much rooted in like the American West, not only as a region, but as like an ideological and discursive construction. I think there's really something to be said for that. These are all great questions and comments, Sean. Um, uh, I'm also just thinking that you know um, Jeff and Charnel's and and um, and Julie's efforts to make you think a little more like transnationally or, or the extent to which um, these kind of discourses and ideologies sort of differ across national boundaries also just makes me wonder if there's a kind of historical narrative here as well because you know as I was sort of saying I think. You know, a lot of the modernist sort of disillusion with finding meaning really came out of the First World War, right? Um, civilization suddenly looks like a, a calamity and not like any form of progress. And the question is, well, what the heck do we do now? Um, uh, and so it seems like maybe some of these answers, we return to nature or we put faith in the nation state or we believe in some kind of transcendental uh, whiteness 
um, could be sort of answers to the kind of disillusionment that kind of come up. And I wonder if there is a kind of chronological, um, you know, narrative to, to, to suss out of, of these sources that, that those modernists kind of uh, turn to that, like kind of increasingly um, as sort of time goes on after um, the war, the, the, the great war that is. And, um, and, you know, certainly just in, you know, in thinking of an American context, I mean, that would track with the high degree of kind of racial violence and rise of the KKK after the war and a kind of a national um, kind of insularity and kind of American, you know, isolationism that, that rises in that period as well. Jeremy, I'm so sorry. My, my AirPods just picked up. It cut you off like halfway into your comment. And I'm so sorry. I was scrambling to turn off my Bluetooth. It's been doing that on and off. I don't know what's going on. I, I truly apologize. No problem. I can, uh, we, we can talk offline if, if, and I can repeat it. I'm so sorry about that. No problem. Okay. Well, um, any other takers? If not, Sean, I'll, I'll leave you with concluding comments and remarks. Uh, thank you all so much for this wonderful feedback. Um, I, I really think this project has grown a lot in the workshop setting and now here as well. And I'm very grateful to your attentive reading and listening and help me think about um, how to develop this project. Um, so just thank you so much for your time and um, for, for everything. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the Tanner team, OC Tanner Foundation, and the College of Humanities as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.